around the pool and around at the same time at the end. It's good. Yeah. And they put a load of extra chairs in. Is this protection? That's <laughs> <laughs> where security are going to be, that idea is. Um, on the bits of paper, just copy down um, four circles, please. And I always like to start the sessions that I do with a bit of, um, bit of creativity. There's a number of reasons why, which I'll explain afterwards. Um, can you turn, in a way appropriate to you, there are no rights or wrongs, can you turn those four circles, please, into what you do, four things you'll find on a farm? No rights or wrongs. Four things. Turn the circles into four things you'll find on a farm. the same thing for the brain. Uh, I don't know how brain friendly your schools are, but uh, we'll, we'll perhaps touch on some more brain stuff as we go through, we'll see how it goes over the next hour. But any understanding of getting more out of the young people in your care ultimately revolves around understanding and tweaking what goes on between ears. It's all about brains in so many ways. It's the brain stupid. You heard, that? You heard the phrase, it's the economy stupid? Uh, President Clinton last time was elected on, uh, elected on his French door, French door. Uh, what's the most important thing to focus on in the election? It's the economy stupid. For your staff room doors, it's the brain stupid. No matter what's going on, for better or for worse, in the lessons, is a result of things going on between these yours and theirs. And the more you know about that, the more you can work with that and bring the best out of them in that, in, in that way. So the mental lingering, what's the, as they walk into the classroom, what is it that hits them 
that gets their brains going in a way where they can't fail. It's not just a whatever do last lesson and give them a question to supposedly review what they learned last lesson. Because uh, if they if they don't remember, they fail. If they do remember, they just we just narrow it down. If we're talking about developing independent thinking, creativity, resilience, then we have to be sharing with them questions where there aren't answers. Because answers are dead end. And answers are full stop. Uh, um, so if you give them questions with answers all the time, then it's easy to come to a dead end with your thinking. And I'll come back to that as well. I'll show you ways of getting kids' brains to that, that then works to build up the sort of mental and emotional resilience that we're, um, uh, that we're looking for. Also starting that way, it's trying to get you in the right sort of um, state for learning as well. Uh, increasingly, because we now know a little bit more about how the brain learns, it's become quite mechanistic. You know, we need to have dual processing, where what you say and what's on the board are the same thing. We need not to give them too much cognitive load, so we don't uh, stress them too much uh, so that they can learn. We do space learning, so they repeat and they remember better. That. And all that stuff is fine and good, and what I noticed looking at all that literature is we're, we're losing things to do with emotions, which are right at the heart of the learning process. Those of you might know about the sort of the, the, the model of the three-part brain. We have the, 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 uh, the reptilian brain, the emotional brain, and then the neocortex, the sort of thinking brain. It's not entirely accurate, but it's a good model. But that emotional part of our brain, that limbic system, that mammalian brain, is right at the heart of the learning process. And without emotions, there isn't any long-term memory and long-term learning. So to what extent are you planning lessons that specifically, specifically set out to generate certain sorts of emotions. And there's no good emotions or bad emotions. Failing can lead to good positive emotions. Frustration can be good. Frustration leads to creativity, according to Freud, I think it was. So there's no good or bad emotions, but we need to make sure that we're engaging that emotional brain in order for the... Well, I mentioned this to a teacher years ago, and he said he was told, to teach he was told, you have to contain, entertain, explain. And that it doesn't work in any other order. And it fits in with that sort of brain-brain theory model. Contain. Freedom from fear, emotional safety and security. It's okay, you can't fail, you can't be wrong. It's a bit of a laugh, you share with your friend all the things I've tried to do in the last couple of minutes. Um, entertain, positive emotions. Not the teacher doing a song and dance routine at all, that's not what it's about. Um, and then explain. Then you get to the bit where you can actually sort of get on with the more sort of academic teaching and learning in your life. So, how do you create effective neurochemistry? The minute the children come into the, into the, into the school grounds, in the